Uh, and the way the session is going to run today is sort of along these lines. We will give you, first of all, uh, an overview of the process that actually got us to those decisions. So you can have some sort of understanding around the issue of life risk, which is at the basis of the decisions that have been made. And I've got Diane Turner from uh, Sarah, who's going to be doing that presentation for us and taking us through that. Uh, followed by that, uh, someone who you've probably also got pretty familiar with in, in recent months, or probably years, frankly, is Jan Kopek. Jan really heads up that geotechnical team on the SARA side. There's been a combination of geotech work from both the City Council uh, and from uh, the special staff uh, at SARA. I'm going to just take you through, after that, the section 124s and uh, the implications of those, uh, what they mean, uh, and the changes that have taken place. Then I've got uh, Denise Kidd. Hi, Denise. Denise is going to be talking to us uh, about the support and assistance packages uh, and the offers for the red zone, which are still being defined, but in general terms. We can give you some more understanding around those. Then I'll ask uh, Diane, again, just to probably sum up the main points, and I think that'll take in total maybe 30 to 45 minutes, depending on some of those discussions. I don't, I certainly don't mind if you've got an, an absolute point of technical clarica clarification uh, with one of our experts, especially with Jan, uh, by all means sort of ask for that clarification. But what I'd really like to be able to do is to get through to the end of all the presentations so that those of you who need that overview have got the context and then we'll spend uh, half an hour or so going through the, um, the sort of Q&A session. So there'll be questions that some will have that you can ask that will actually be very, very useful for everybody else. And then following that, we've got a whole bunch of people here from EQC, uh, from SARA, from the City Council, from accommodation support people, geotechnical engineers, a raft of people that you can then get some one-on-one -on -one time with and maybe get those questions that are truly specific to your actual property or your site worked through. I've got Bruce Empson from EQC who I should have introduced. Bruce is uh, going to give us a bit of a chat around some of the EQC issues. Inevitably there are one or two of those. We've got insurers present too, I think. We've got some insurers here today, down the back of the room, so very close to the door. Very sensible, very sensible move, only because you need the fresh air, of course. And uh, I think we've got the Sallies here as well who are going to do a cup of tea and a bit of afternoon tea for you. So once we get through the Q&A, uh, there's no rush. We're not going to be clearing off out of here quickly. Grab a cup of tea, engage with the people that you uh, need to engage with along the way. And one of the other groups that are here, uh, and I think really importantly so, are uh, um, mental health professionals. And I don't think there are any of us who don't in some way carry, you know, some of that, that traumatic stress syndrome and uh, carry a level of, uh, you know, stuff we've got to deal with. And it's really important to be completely open about that and to deal with it and to get some help if you need it. No, none of us could have ever predicted in our lives, I think, that we would find ourselves in a situation like this. I know it doesn't seem fair a lot of the time, it's certainly not easy for any of us as just ordinary people. There's an awful lot to cope with. So it's important to recognize that there are some additional services. And sometimes it's not for you. Sometimes it's for somebody you know and you care about deeply. And you can see that they're having a very, very hard time. And uh, you might be able to direct them in the right, uh, right way. So those people are here to uh, give you some support. So I'll move on to Diane now. Diane's going to uh, take us through the uh, context and the background and uh, kind of, I guess, put the decision-making process into some sort of a framework. So welcome along, Diane. Good to have you here. Good afternoon. It's very, um, it's great to be here. I just want to 
acknowledge my boss, Roger, who would I know would have preferred to have been here this afternoon, but he's got um, some very important family commitments that he needed to keep. So he has been to all the other presentations this week, but was unable to make the one this afternoon. So um, you might not know me, but I'm the G General Manager, Strategy, Planning and Policy, and have been working very closely on this issue since I started with Sarah last September. So. It is um, my team that have been working with the scientists and the geotechnical engineers to get the um, information to the Minister so that he's been able to make a decision. I want to um, firstly acknowledge that, that you have been waiting a long time for these decisions and we're sorry that it has taken so long. It has been a very complex process and I can assure you that there have been a lot of people working very hard to get to the stage where the Minister was able to make most of the decisions last Friday. We certainly acknowledge the impact, the ongoing impact on people who are still waiting for decisions, but I have um, both my staff and, and engineers out in the field working on these issues right now. Um, I think the time taken really reflects the complexity of the issues and um, they're certainly some of the most complex that I've worked with. The, the decision making process is based on both scientific information, so we had um, the Christchurch City Council initially contracted the GNS to do a lot of work around issues such as risk and some of the scientific background to risk and its application to the environment that we live in, as well as the work that was um, undertaken over a very long period by what is known as the Port Hills um, Geotechnical Governance Group or something, the, the bunch of engineers that have been racing around the hills and, and probably have intimate knowledge of every rock, nook and cranny, cranny in the Port Hills. So it's um, the decision, the policy decision made by the government is based on some very sound information that has both scientific and an engineering basis. Uh, during this process it has really been a joint initiative between CERA and the Christchurch City Council. So the Christchurch City Council were working with the engineers on a lot of the early information gathering and understanding the risks that, are, that were applied and then in the, um, throughout we have been working very closely but as it got closer to the policy decision and the need to inform the Minister of Civil, um, the Christchurch earthquake recovery, um, we took up more of a policy perspective and, and there was a lot of higher involvement with CERA. But throughout the process we have worked very closely as a team and um, I think that's reflected in the presentations that you're seeing, the information on the websites and the, and the way that we are collaborating together on this process for you. As I mentioned earlier, it has taken a long time um, but that's simply a reflection of the complexity of the issues. Uh, there are a, a, a large number of different settlement areas in the Port Hills and they each have their own distinct set of issues. So we've needed to understand each of those on, a, on an area by area basis. Sometimes it's a street, sometimes it's a, a bit of a bigger area than that. We're aware that um, decisions, when, when you have to make a decision, not everyone's going to be happy about the outcome and we certainly acknowledge that that will be the case in, in, in these set of decisions because there will be people that are red that don't want to be red, there will be people that are green that think that they should be red and of course um, there are people in the white zone that, that are still waiting for their decisions. In, in regard to that, there will be an appeal process uh, that's yet to be defined but I think um, if you want to have an understanding of how that might run, I encourage you to look on the CERA website where there is the outline for the uh, flatland appeal process, which is uh, we're currently running through that right now. It will be a, a slightly different basis, but um, there will be likely to be a lot of similarities. Like the offer that hasn't gone out yet, the appeal process is yet to be determined by the Minister. But again, he felt that it was important that you had the decisions as early as possible so at least you could be considering the implications for yourselves and your families. So hopefully over the next um, month or so, or couple of months depending on, on the time frames, we will be rolling out these other 
decisions to help you through the process of making your decisions. In terms of the decisions themselves, um, there was a much larger area of the Port Hills that was initially zoned white and, and last year there were a couple of um, decisions made by the Minister that turned a large number of the properties in the Port Hills green. This last decision saw a little over 1,100 properties zoned green. A further 285 properties were zoned red and 191 of those were as a result of cliff collapse and 94 due to rock roll. As mentioned, there are still those 166 properties zoned white. Um, of those, there are eight in Lucas Lane, which have a query around the landslip issue in that area. The Minister has indicated that the white zone decisions will be completed in terms of rock roll by the 17th of August and the end of, August, end of October for the Lucas Lane decisions. The reason for Lucas Lane taking longer is because of the um, more detailed investigations that are required to be able to make the policy decisions. All the decisions that apply to the properties are shown on the zoning maps which are available on the CERA website. There have been a range of technical investigations carried out. There are the GNS reports, and there was a GeoVert study around rock roll, which um, you've, we've already made presentations on, but there'll be further information, I think, this afternoon in the presentation on that, but that was commissioned by CERA. So it is our expectation that we will be releasing these reports and any other technical information as soon after all the decisions have been completed as, as is possible. So the three main issues that we had to deal with in the Port Hills were cliff collapse, rock roll and landslip. And for some properties it was a combination of two. So cliff collapse is really um, what you see as you drive in here you know, from, from the city out to Sumner where, they, where the cliff has actually sheared off. And the decisions around whether or not to zone red were largely based on in a kind of simple uh, explanation whether or not if there was an, another earthquake whether or not a, a, a tract of that cliff would shear off in the next earthquake so it was more either either the cliff has sheared off and um, people's properties are right on the edge or demolished already or people are at the bottom or they would in the event of another earthquake um, that their properties would suffer similar damage to those that have already been largely damaged by the earthquakes that we've had. There is, um, in terms of the, the properties that have gone red, that are, 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 some people might think that they're close to the cliff, well there's been a, a great deal of uh, technical uh, data go into making the decision to turn green and the determination was that it is safe for people to live there and that um, in turning green that you can work individually with your insurance companies to make decisions about your properties if they're damaged. While you're essentially in a white zone there is no ability to advance that decision making process. So those that have gone red have gone red because of either the fact that the property has already been damaged or is likely to be, very likely, there's a very high, high risk of it being damaged in the next earthquake. Rock roll is um, probably the most challenging area that um, we've had to deal with in this decision-making process. And the reason that it has been most challenging uh, will, some of that will come out in Jan's presentation, but basically there has to have been a judgment made around whether or not where rocks would roll and what would happen in the event of future earthquakes and what the risk was to life and limb in that situation. So those that have turned red have turned red because the risk is so high that it's um, you know in the same as a cliff collapse, either the rocks have already rolled or they're going to be there. Um, in the event of a, an earthquake, no matter what the intensity. The, the white zone area that is still white is, is that because there is still some uh, important analysis to go on before the minister can make his final decision. 
landslip. Um, landslip is, um, is an interesting area because all over New Zealand we have areas that are subject to landslip. And so in the case of the Port Hills, a lot of the landslips movement happened as a result of the earthquake and there's been no further movement. However, there will need to be ongoing monitoring in the areas, in those areas. So in terms of the zones, um, I've covered some of this, but um, the, the large judgment in terms of rock roll was around life risk. So the likelihood for um, it to impact on you as uh, owners and, and residents in the properties and the people that are going to visit you or the um, servicemen that are coming, the mail delivery, etc., that, that um, visit residential areas in the course of everyday life. So in the work that was done through GNS and, the asset, and further assessments that were made, an acceptable life risk in a normal everyday event is... is judged to be about 1 in 10,000. Now, the difficulty with the concept of life risk is that there's actually no hard and fast rule. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, different people will have different opinions on this. So, you know, I might be prepared to expose myself to a greater risk than my sister or my brother or my friend or my neighbour. But at the end of the day, a judgment has to be made in order to be able to make decisions about zoning. And that judgment was based on the best advice that was available to us and what is, in effect, uh, best practice, not only in New Zealand, but around the world. So green zone essentially um, is acceptable risk and red zone is unacceptable risk. Now this is quite different to the flatland where it was around land damage. So in the Port Hills the issue is around life risk, not land damage. And as I said earlier, the white zone is where more analysis is needed to draw that line. So in terms of um, determining acceptable risk, it is also in the decisions that have been made, given the fact that we have been in a period of heightened risk due to the fact that there has not only been one earthquake here but four, um, the, all things being equal, it was considered that that risk would fall at quite a significant rate over the next four-year four period. So there was a transition where some properties that, that are going green will hit that 1 in 10,000 mark um, in 2016. So in terms of the white zone, for those of you that are here that are in the white zone, the, the question that has been has to be answered in order to the um, for the decision to be made is uh, are there a range of properties that fall between the red, which is a risk of higher than one in a thousand, and those that are in the green, which is um, lower than one in five thousand, ranging through to the 2016 figure of one in ten thousand. So um, it is quite frustrating, you know, we appreciate that it is frustrating because essentially your lives are on hold, uh, but it is really important because we, we recognise that these decisions impact significantly on people's lives and wellbeing, so we want to make sure that when the decisions are made, that they're made in the best possible light in terms of the best possible information. So there is, we're already commissioning work to make that. We've advised the minister on the, um, we're in the process of advising the minister on how he will be able to achieve the, the target of getting decisions out to you by the uh, 17th of August. So there have been um, a lot of questions in the presentations this week about mitigation um, a lot of people have been, as I understand it, expected to see in the decision making answers around um, or options for mitigation and remediation. At this point in time, um, the decisions that have been made by the Minister have been pretty clear in that land that needed to be red was red and land that could go green without further works has gone green. As I said earlier, there is further work going on in the white white zone and, and part of the understanding around the decisions will be 
whether or not they can achieve a, a, a life risk in, in, within the context of the, of the decisions that have already been made. So, moving on to Jan. Thanks very much, and thank you for coming this afternoon. If it's you're looking right now, I'm going to go, as I've done in the previous presentations, through the three geotechnical um, issues on the Port Hills. We're starting off with um, slippage, and then we're going to go over to cliff collapse and then um, rock roll. Um, I've selected for uh, cliff collapse the areas around um, Sumner. That's going to be Red Cliffs, Peacock's Gallop, um, the cliff behind us, which is Richmond Hill and Whitewash Head. And then I'm going to be talking about some a couple of adjacent areas over here. So if I don't cover your area, please see me afterwards. I'm going to be staying behind, okay? If you go on land slippage, there are four different types of land slippages that manifested themselves on Port Hills. Two are separate. One of them associated with cliff collapse, the other one associated with Lucas Lane, which is being dealt with separately. But if you're looking generally on land slippage and looking at the um, smaller slippage, such as this little slip within the hillside itself, then that generally relates to seismic shaking. And I'm sure most of you actually have uh, properties on elevated terrain. There is some form of land movement. That simply relates to the uh, filling and cutting and um, small retaining walls. And given the amount of seismic shaking we have had, the performance uh, was actually very, very good because geotechnical engineers would never be able to design a retaining wall to not deform underneath these um, large accelerations. Essentially, we're turning the slope sideways and shaking it very hard before we're turning back up the way. Okay, So this expectance that we have some land deformation. The other um, our area of land slippage, which manifested itself, if you have here the river, and this generally is the Heathcote River, not the Avon, as it actually goes at the bottom of the Port Hills, and the land around it is susceptible to liquefaction as well. So as the land liquefies during seismic shaking, what it actually does remove is a support over here which holds the um, deep-seated uh, slips back. So that toe uh, is temporarily removed and it actually moves downhill. And quite often we have observed land cracking parallel to the rivers. Uh, fairly um, high uphill. So there are different type of cracking indicate different types of deformations that actually occurred in the hills. A lot of the cracks have been mapped both by EQC and the Port Hills Geotechnic Group and by GNS. So that data is uh, being all assembled. And EQC is looking more on individual land damage, whereas the Port Hills Geotechnic Group from Council were looking over the overall geotechnical hazards. So two very different level approaches. If you right now go to cliff collapse, which most of you are aware over here, this is the community that's been affected most. So if you're actually looking at the cliff, previously the cliff extended over here, and then in subsequent events, and we probably can count four major aftershocks of these ones are uh, the February aftershock, the April aftershock, which was the Easter aftershock, then we have June and we have December. Of these four major aftershocks, only two cause significant land damage in terms of cliff collapses. And that's probably the first message to take home with you is cliff collapse happens or is triggered by um, strong seismic shaking. And the trigger or the threshold which you actually need to start shaking is about 0.4 G or 40% of gravity. Before then, we have not observed massive amounts of damage. So small parts are coming off, but we're talking in terms of cobbles, pebbles, or um, call it wheelbarrow-sized material coming down there. 0.4 G start to initiate small cliffs to collapse, material to come off, okay? Um, when we had um, seismic instruments over here, June recorded uh, accelerations of about twice gravity, so 200% gravity. And that gives you an indication how much actually shaking has occurred. The other thing is that generally these type of cliffs are at the back bottom of the ridge spurs because the spur has been cut away by the sea. And as the seismic energy gets trapped 
in the spur, it behaves like the end of a web and actually focuses the energy on it. So it actually, uh, the accelerations are much higher in the surrounding land. And that's what we have observed on all the large clefts itself. But essentially what happens, this material over here is being accelerated out and then the gravity actually drops down. And we're looking at two different mechanisms. We're looking at the uh, cliffs, which are the 60 to 100 meter tall ones, the red cliffs, the whitewash heads, Peacock's Color, Bridgman Hill, which are the four ones. But we have also about 45 smaller cliffs, the 15, 20 meter high ones. And if you go down to the bottom of Nayland Street, you see um, how these actually collapse. So we have large chunks of material essentially being thrown out, rolling over, and actually ending directly below it. So it's not the debris apron over here, um, but rather large blocks actually dislodge themselves. As the debris actually impacts down at the bottom, what actually does happen in a subsequent event, much more material is down there already. It actually influences how the material is deposited down at the bottom of it. It spreads much further. It actually acts more as a ski jump down at the bottom. So the material initially falls down on a flat level surface as it did in Peacock's Gallop, and the next time it deposits further. So we've considered all these ones in our modeling. If you're looking at the cliff tops, and I'm sure most of you have been to um, cliff tops at some point in the last year and a bit, so you have seen some extensive cracking at the top. And we have observed cracks such as those ones running in the top up to 40 to 60 meters back from the cliff edge than the current cliff edge. So what we have to assume based on the past two um, events that um, it's not just the house directly at the edge, but also at least the first row at the back that are a potential um, risk of future collapse. And why these areas being zoned red is very simple. It's a mechanistic approach. If a large earthquake occurs, we have very little, if any, uh, warning before actually the land does go over the edge. Even with our best methods, we cannot predict where it will happen. So we didn't have continuously 10 meters loss of the entire um, cliff edge, but sometimes we have only a meter loss, but in other years, 10, 15 meters. And obviously, if there is sufficient setback from the cliff edge um, at the moment, then you've been turned green. Uh, the best thing if I actually show you a couple of examples. So Peacock's Gallop over here, I'm sure you all know this area. This is the road to Monks Bay and to, uh, from Sumner to Christchurch. Now what we have over here, and I'm starting at the bottom over here. That aerial photograph was taken on the 23rd of February. So it was taken one day after the big earthquake. And what you can see over here is the debris that actually fell down on that particular day. All right. Now the white line shows the debris from June. So you can see how much further it actually went. That's the first information. Hence, we have installed initially the protection work over here and to short distance over here. And after June, we extended the protection work in terms of containers further and uh, actually enclosing the entire area. These are not empty containers. There's actually 20 tons of ballast in the bottom of them. And the top one is connected rigidly uh, to the one. So even if it does sustain an impact, it still doesn't gonna topple over at the ballast in the containers prevents penetration. We have numerous instances along Wakefield Avenue where we had a um, couple of containers hit by rocks and they actually have proven very, very effective. Now, if you're looking up on top of it, you can see a web of yellow lines over here. And these are cracks, and this is a particular instance at least that wide. So we have not recorded anything smaller than about 50 millimeters. And most of the instances, the cracks are wider than 100 millimeters. The main cracking along over here, that's Kinsey Terrace. In this particular area, we have cracks of 300 millimeters over a wider area. Now, if this is the main spur, and that's Clifton Hill, it's fairly obvious as the area shook during the earthquake, then the front fell out, and the sides were actually accelerated sufficiently for landslides to initiate. So this is landslide um, associated with cliff collapse. And we have a fairly large area over here, which is um, the area where the main access to Clifton occurs, where 
cracking occurred in the periphery, we're a little actually in the middle, and we believe this area is a cliff collapse, associated, uh, sorry, landslide associated with cliff collapse, and the same occurred on the other side. We have also numerous smaller cliffs where we have cracking observed, but generally that's the factual information that's overlaid with the zoning decisions, so you can see the match. So these little areas over here generally associated with the smaller cliffs, 10, 15 meter wide high cliffs that actually have collapsed. Now since we're in Sumner, I'm just going to talk you through um, Richmond Hill. So what we have over here is um, again an area of land slippage. So as the cliff failed, it actually has damaged significantly this area above here. So it caused cracking to occur. Now, if you remember, this area has not significantly failed in actually February. It has failed significantly in June. So the debris at the moment sits over here. If you remember what I told you about a minute and a half ago, the next time we expect the debris to extend much, much further. Hence, the containers are sitting in this area over here. Again, a web of cracking, and the cracking is obviously sub-parallel to the cliff face. Area of deformation that has been mapped. So, again, zoning decisions to match. Now, you may consider the area over here. Why is that actually still green? That's no different than many other areas in Port Hills. The one key issue over here is it is outside the life safety risk. So these lines over here shown are the cliff regression areas where we expect the cliff to go in each subsequent event. So we plotted um, two for earthquakes and one for natural regression. And these areas out over here and the rock face over here provides uh, support or actually buttressing to these properties. Further towards Christchurch, this is the area of Red Cliffs. So Moa Bone Cave over here, Red Cliff School over here. We have again the extent of debris. We have large areas of deformation associated with cliff. This is Defender Lane and Egnot Heights. Glendevere Terrace over here, and then the area around uh, Balmora Lane. If you look at the zoning decision over here. These areas over here are associated with man-made um, quarries. So the material which was quarried in this area, and in this area was used to actually to build up this um, road in the 1930s. That was a depression era uh, work due. So that material came out there. Now what we do know that uh, man-made cliffs on man-made um, slopes behave very differently to natural cliffs. Because natural cliffs are naturally stable because they've been standing there as they've been eroding away. So the material behind us is generally much more hard and much more stable. Natural slopes behave differently, okay? And the last one in the line is Whitewash Head. Now Whitewash Head is the tallest of all cliffs. It's over 100 meters tall, and it has shown the largest amount of loss of material in the orders of hundreds of thousands of cubic meters actually has fallen off cumulatively out of here. It is also different to the other three cliffs, because whereas the debris apron at the bottom of Peacock's Gallop does provide support for parts of the cliff, over here the sea erodes it continuously away. So if you're looking at the cliff regression area, you can see, first of all, we have areas where there is now 20 up to 25 meters in one spot, less land than there was before February. And we had a cliff regression of about 10 meters per event in here. If we consider that, then you can see the earthquake lines running through here and the area of major cliff deformation at the front and zoning to match. If I'm coming right now to boulders, in Rockfall, and again, an area that uh, especially the back parts of Sumner were very vulnerable to. I'm going to explain to you a couple of issues and then I'll show you some maps relating to the zoning. And um, I'm going to show you how we determine essentially the zoning on this diagram over here, and then I'm going to be talking about, about risk in the following diagram. Okay? Christchurch and the Banks Peninsula were, had volcanic activity about 9 million years ago. That that's what we see over here. About 9 million years ago, give or take a million years, uh, the Banks Peninsula actually looked like Mount Taranaki, about that. 
And over the past nine million years, it actually eroded away. Parts of it collapsed to create the Caroa Basins and the Littleton Harbors. And essentially what we have left over are the remaining harder bluffs that actually formed from volcanic lava. And the material generally in these bluffs is a columnar basaltic lava. This is the more the harder material. And actually when it cools, it forms these cylindrical columns that if you've been ever to Ireland, you can actually see, you know, Giant's Causeway is very similar to that one as well. So we have it slightly more eroded. But what actually these sources generate are boulders where the small bits are the size of a suitcase going up to the washing machine and then to the size of a small car. Okay? So that's roughly the particle size distribution. If you're looking at the particles, and particles don't think in terms of dust, it's an engineering term for actually the size of a boulder or the size of sand corn. So the particles, on average, that's the average boulder, are about three cubic meters over here. And the three cubic meter boulder weights about 10 tons. So that's the average for the, uh, for the um, port hills over here. So it's a fairly sizable boulder. So that when we design, we design against the 95th percentile boulder, um, which very closely is actually the, uh, the average boulder. So more larger boulders have fallen down than smaller boulders. That's the message. As the seismic shaking goes, and it goes the similar threshold as for cliff collapse, we need about uh, 0.4 G you know, to release the large number of blocks. And why do we know this? Because we could actually match where the bounce marks were, and then match them up to the source. That's simple geometry, and that's what the geotechnical engineers were doing for a, lo uh, for a while in the hills, trying to actually determine where the boulder on the ground, how it actually got there from the source. And what we actually discovered, we couldn't match the first set of uh, imprints with simply releasing the block, just toppling it out. So, Using computer models, the only way we could actually replicate it by giving the boulder an initial kick, an initial velocity of about one and a half meter sideways and one meter up. So these boulders were actually not just rolling out, they were shot out of the curse socket by the strong seismic shaking which we had. And again, the rock feels much stronger shaking than actually down here on the floods where we have sand which uh, dampens the seismic shaking. So the materials come down. Now if you imagine you would be standing over here next to the tree during one of the large earthquakes, what you actually would see coming past you is a large number of boulders. So the frequency, the number is very, very high. As you go further down the slope, the number of boulders passing you reduces because some of them will actually start to arrest and stop up the slope. And eventually you arrive at a point where no boulder goes past it. Now, if you project a line from here, down slope, it's about 21 degrees. That's the line where no further boulder went further. That's very simplistic. We have determined where the line is that there is negligible risk. So there's no risk whatsoever because a physical boulder cannot reach you in this location. That was actually the basis for the initial zoning decisions. Have we brought the white zone um, closer to the hills and extended the green zone, okay? And then we had a, actually a look at the frequency of the boulder. So what is the chance, and the number I will be talking about, what is the chance of a house being hit by a boulder, penetrating the house, and actually injuring, fatally injuring someone actually being in the house present? That's what the number is about. But the key driver for the rocks, actually the seismicity. So in the number I'm going to be talking about, to two-thirds component included is the seismicity. And the seismicity reduces with time. After the 22nd of February, after December, and after June, if you actually remember, directly after the main shock, there was a lot of aftershocks. They came one after another, and they were fairly large as well. As the time has passed, the, their frequency reduced as well. So we're expecting less earthquakes, and they will be less and less frequent. I'm talking right now about decades rather than actually the next weeks, okay? The other third to the number contributes to the natural weathering. Contrary to popular opinion, there was always rockfall present actually in Sumner. 
and the rest of the Port Hills. If you go back to the historical archives from Canterbury Museum, um, newspaper clippings, um, then the EQC database, and so on, we actually averaged about 20 events per year uh, for the area affected by the earthquakes over here in the Port Hills. So it was always active. But the key difference is it always was one boulder or two boulders or a smear debris slide that just took the back of a house out. Right? It was never the large earthquake was dislodged 5,000 boulders in the Port Hills. And that's the key difference. But we contributed about a third to the model and maintained um, it. So that's roughly what we happen and the colors of the houses are where we actually see, see the zoning decisions. So if you green down here, it doesn't mean that the boulder hasn't been hitting you, or it doesn't mean that your chance of another repeat will not actually, or may not get a boulder through it, but the chance is very, very low. And the number we've been talking about is one in 5,000. Now, and in four years, it will reduce to one in 10,000. So the risk will be much lower, and I'm gonna talk about it in a second. The houses in the red zone over here, the models which Jane has supplied to us, indicate that the life safety risk number over there is lower by about an order of magnitude, so about a one in thousand at the moment. So houses over there are generally closer to the bluffs. They are area, sitting in an area where rockfall is more frequent to occur, and they have a much higher chance to actually be hit and penetrated. That's the reason they're called red. Now, I'm going to talk very quickly about remediation because that question usually comes up over here. If you're looking at effectiveness of remediation, and that's to, we're talking about meshing up in the source, putting fences, putting buns in here, or even putting a forest in between yourself and the um, bluffs. Even if you actually do all three of those, at the best, at the best, you reduce it to about an order of magnitude. So if you're sitting at a life safety risk number now at one in 500 and put a very expensive set of remediation measures behind you, you will never get better than one in 5,000. And that's still with the time on decay on it. So it's very ineffective. And the other uh, issue we have had from um, experts who actually do this, and we're talking about international experts both in risk and in rockfall, um, they have indicated that generally rockfall protection structures such as fences and bunts are actually designed for the individual boulders coming down, so the weather-related uh, incidents, for the um, snowstorm, for the rainfall, that actually dislodges probably, uh, you know, five or ten boulders in the Port Hills, but not for the event where you actually have thousands or five thousand boulders coming down there. And the number is very, very simply. We have about 500 blocks of boulders or, uh, or particles on, say, um, Wakefield Avenue in the area over there. So Wakefield Avenue has about 500 rocks recorded per event. If you consider 500 meter length of fence, there are 500 blocks coming down there. On average, we have on one block per meter length impacting. The fence panels are about 10 meters wide, so we have about 10 blocks per panel. Now, most of the, uh, the design work, and you can download it yourself, is designed for one boulder impact. There are fences which actually ramp up the category up to three levels up. That will take up two boulders. But the boulder, second boulder impact, is taken into account that you have an impact, you remove the boulder and don't do any maintenance on it, and then still have the capability to secure a second boulder. Right? We're talking about 10 boulders. Admittedly, not all of them are the size of my Land Rover, but a lot of them will be the size of a washing machine, smaller. They're coming at speed. And the other thing which we have over here, which generally doesn't happen in other areas, because the material is so angular, as it starts to roll downhill, it starts to interact with the ground and starts to spin. So as it impacts the fence, it doesn't go statically into it, it actually rolls. So if you go into the uh, website for the manufacturers, they generally test them by dropping a static block into the net. It doesn't spin. 
and the spinners an additional 20 30 percent of the energy out of these ones so at the moment the advice and we're working with the manufacturers together to actually see what availability of remediation options there are but at the moment there is no new zealand or international standard available that actually would account for the situation we are in at the moment okay even if you look about buns, which have much higher energy absorption capacities, generally they can only take so much in terms of boulders before they penetrate as well. And the one difference again is we have higher rotational spin, so they're actually going to fall down and run up the slope. So you would need actually a bench or a berm with a little fence on top of it anyway you still have the same issue. So this is the advice we've been given by the engineers at the moment working. So one of the reasons I'm here on my own today and the other geotechnical engineers aren't with me because they're working today and the weekend to actually resolve some of these issues. So if I'm actually going to go to the seismic hazard risk model, and that drives a lot of the numbers, then let me explain. Over here we have the life safety risk number. So it's from 100 to 1 in 10,000 over here. This is time over here. So this was 1st of January of um, 2012. We are roughly over here right now. So we already have a slight decay. Now, what are these colors? Where are they? So let me go to this diagram over here. We have here the hill, and roughly over here we have the rockfall source. That could be one or two bluffs. If you go to the bottom of the slope, or if I would be standing with the rocks behind me, at about 21 degrees, looking down to the valley, that would be the maximum extent of the rockfall. So if I come closer to the hill, so if I go from here further uphill, then the frequency of boulders will change, as will my likelihood of being hit by the boulders. So if I'm up here, in this area, the blue line up blue applies for me. If I'm down here, the green line does. Now, as you can see, the current exposure is about 1 in 300 in this area over here. It will never reduce to more than 1 in 1,000, even if you wait for another 30 years. Even protective works over here would marginally actually increase it. If you're looking down here, what you can see it's 1 in 1,000, but very quickly, even over the next 10 years, actually reduces significantly. So the rate of decay is different for the or in, uh, for the place you are actually on the hills, simply before cause of the numbers of blocks coming down. And what drives this is a natural uh, seismic hazard model, and it's not something we have invented specifically for the Port Hills. It's the same model GNS have developed with international experts that's being used for building design or repairing of infrastructure. So it is exactly the same model, okay? So again, the closer you're down at the valley, the less likely you're actually uh, being hit because the number of borders is less frequent. Probably just go and show you a couple of examples what we have done um, with the risk maps, and I'll show you our risk map and show you other information. I'm starting over from Bridal Path in Morgan's Valley and work my way slowly over into Sumner, okay? Now, all these rocks over here are the rocks recorded by a Port Hills Geotechnic Group, Urban Search and Rescue, GNS, and been mapped over the last 12 months. And this information is publicly available. So if you go to the Crash City Council website, all these maps are there free for the download. And they've been there for the last six months. The first thing you realize, especially in the Morgan's Valley, you can see there's a shelter belt with a track. You can see it has arrested a lot of boulders. There's a awful lot of numbers actually uh, boulders that actually went further down but you can see already in this area where we have actually a little spurs and valleys they tend to um, actually drop into these valleys and then actually run into them what we have done we have used a 3d model and actually numerically dislodged a lot of boulders and the model was developed for essentially the uh, Wakefield and Hubbardin Avenue areas an area represented by this so we have essentially a relatively planar surface, and we have on top of it one or two, three bluffs, and the bluffs are about 20, 30 meters high, dust lodging material. The model in this particular area under predicts where the boulders will run to. So it will say, look, they should stop all over here. 
whereas we have a large a number of boulders that actually went much, much further than what the model says. And there's a very simple explanation to it. The source over here, if you're in Morgan's Valley, is much, much higher than 20 meters. It's up to 80 meters tall, some of the bluffs. And what happens during the seismic shaking, the blocks don't fall out, they're being thrown out. And as they're thrown out, they actually go and under gravity fall, and they fall for 60, 80 meters. So, so by the time they hit the first time round, they already have about 70 to 90 kilometers per hour in terms of speed. And then what happens is the same thing you all did as kids. You take a stone and skip it over the water. So it starts to skip rather than bounce and roll. And that way they actually lose much less energy. And that's the reason they actually go much further. So what we have observed over here is appropriate to areas like Rapaki, for example, as well, where we have long, large slopes with the possibility of actually boulders falling longer distances. But generally, the model agrees quite well. And the risk model is now shown over here. Now, we've been asked, where is the risk model? To some degree, this is the risk model. So looking at one in 1,000, if the house footprint, the house itself, is being crossed by the one in 1,000 line, the area went red. If the house itself, not the area of the property, but the house, the buildable area where you spend your time in, has been touched by the a line that says you're currently in one in 5,000, you will be one in 10,000 by the year 2016, the year of end green. Now, what do these numbers mean? Okay, very, very simply. There are 400 people participating in driving, either driven with a bus or driving with a bus or driving actively themselves. In New Zealand, there are 4 million people, 400 by 4 million. And 400 is the number of people that actually are fatalities per year in roading accidents. The number is one in 10,000. So that's an activity you all participate in. And you, the chance of any individual to actually be killed in a roading accident is one in 10,000 per year. If you're looking at um, motorcycling, the number is about one in 1,000. That doesn't mean there are more people being killed because they are still included in the 400, but it's less people doing the sport. And it's the one number divided by the other one. If you do mountain climbing, then the number is about one in 100. If you do crop dusting regularly as a pilot, it's about one in 50. If you're subject to um, risky medical procedures, it could be as low as one in one. Okay, So that's roughly what the number mean. International advice, was there is no life safety number that is correct, but in New Zealand, we have used one in 10,000 over a fairly long period of time as a life safety acceptance criteria for natural hazards. If you uh, think about Lahars, the number is one in 10,000. If you look about tsunami inundation, South Shore, for example, and other low-lying areas of the country, the number is again one in 10,000. So what we have done in the Port Hills is no different than what is actually being done in the New Zealand regulatory framework. Okay? The question is right now, the number is higher. Yes, it is. It's about 1 in 5,000. But the risk halves per um, five years passing. And we are already halfway through the first year, which is the largest decrease. So, and that's the one where the 1 in 1,000 comes into it. If I half the risk every five years. So if you still follow me, if I'm currently worse than one in 1,000, so if I'm one in 999, and I half my risk in the next five years, I'm gonna be only one in 2,000. If I wait another five years, I'm gonna be one in 4,000. If I wait another five years, I'm only gonna be one in 8,000. So I'll never get there. If I'm currently one in 5,000, I give me five years, one in 10,000. Following five years, I will be in one in 20,000. So it's a logarithmic decay. It's not a linear decay. Okay? That's how these number, uh, numbers are being calculated. And what we have done is no different to the rest in New Zealand. So again, to recap, where the buildings over here are bisected by the um, 
or touched by the one in 5,000 years today, it will be one in 10,000 in 2016. And that's assuming a conservative risk model. It could decay much faster and the line could move very quickly uphill as well. So and that's again what the engineers are working with GNS right now on. If you are touched by the one in thousand line at the moment, that's where we decided red. There are a couple of apparent anachronisms. So if you're looking at this property, it's surrounded by red, right? But actually, the house is sitting up here. The house has been touched by the one in thousand line. And what we see over here is a driveway. And we zoned the section. So the section below the house, the house is here, this section over here, is in the intermediate line. So if you are wide, you're sitting right now between 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 5,000 in the line. If we go further, that's the zoning decision for bridal path. Looking at Samna, that's probably going to be of most interest to you. There are, first of all, two different colors of red. So we have the color in red over here and the color of red, especially along Heberden Avenue, the darker red. Um, is cliff collapse red. Now in these areas, you will probably say cliff collapse. These ones actually had rocks through the back of the properties, and they're dead. But cliff collapse always trumps rock fall. Okay, so in terms of risk, cliff collapse is always going to be much higher. Rock fall is second higher, and then land slippage. Now there are properties in the Port Hills, not in Sumner, that are affected by all three hazards. Okay, so it's a compounding risk. So if you are sitting in an area where you have cliff collapse, you have to consider the number, but then you have to compound it by rockfall as well. These dark maroon colors is rockfall red, and then white and green, obviously, again for rockfall. If I'm overlying the boulders that we actually observed, and I actually mentioned once again, we have not sort out every single boulder that has fallen the Port Hills. We looked at representative samples. What we have done, the team over in Habitat Avenue actually had a look at the representative areas of boulders. They tried to collect as many boulders as there were in order to see where they actually trended to. So which way they actually went into the valleys and with the shed of the ridges. The team on the other side actually were looking at specific designated areas and had a much higher resolution. So they try to pick up as many boulders as they could find on these areas. So we have a comparison of generally where do you go or they go and areas that actually are being investigated more in detail. And that gives us an idea whether we actually have any data errors on them or not. So the representative samples were taken from here and from this area. Areas, for example, over here were not assessed because the bush is very dense. But what we have used, we have used LIDAR and we have used high resolution aerial photographs to actually determine whether our vegetation was bent. And the first set of high resolution and low resolution photographs start to come as quickly as six hours after the earthquakes. So this is the boulders in Sumner. This is the um, 3D work. You can see in Sumner, the back of Wakefield, there is some uh, debris which came actually all the way up from uh, Windsor Castle. That was actually confirmed by the geology. We found boulders down in this area over here, which came all the way from up there. So it actually matches. Now, what, is the what do the color means? Generally, if you're in the area of green to blue, you are in a corridor that naturally attracts rocks. So if you actually look where we have the area over here, you can see the depositional environment of the rocks actually matches where the model predicts a lot of rocks will be running down. And the same, even if you look at um, taking the lower resolution on Habit and Avenue, you can still see that the rocks generally trending down these valleys. So it's a frequency of boulders that will come down slope. But overlaying over here is essentially the, uh, the zoning as it was um, then implemented on the 29th of June. And then essentially that is the current zoning position. I'm just going to go very quickly. Do we have people from Littleton over here? Yep. So again, the boulder sources over here, we're looking at a much larger area, but notably the areas over here, and again, the areas over here. If we then again overlay the 3D work, 
there's one notable area, especially down in here, where the boulders went actually much further down than the model, model predicts. And in this particular instance, there's a high bluff behind it of Mount Cavendish and the surrounding areas. And um, again, it has the same effect as on the other side of the valley. The boulders can actually pick up a much more speed, so they just travel further. So if you're looking at, again, the zoning decisions, most of the land over here is privately owned farmland to some degree and dock land over here. So the majority of the habitation actually occurs down on the lower slopes of uh, Littleton. And again, if I highlight in the final zoning over here. So if you're looking at Rapaki and Cass Bay, Cass Bay over here, Rapaki over here, Rapaki Marai down here. And one of the notable large boulders was in this house over here. It was one of the houses that was penetrated by a fairly sizable block numerous times. Okay, so it had one 400-ton boulder going through it and two 70-ton boulders coming into it. And that's what's different about Rapaki area over here. You can see, first of all, the topographical elevation, the large bluffs, and the number of blocks actually coming down here. Caspe, pretty much at the end of zoning decision, then one rockfall outcrops is along here in this ridge. That's where the um, gas pipeline actually runs to. All right? So there's a couple of rock bluffs over here. Someone actually tried, especially in this area, to fix the rockfall previously using ship ropes. So there's actually rusted ropes with a bow tie sitting in it. So not a very effective um, protection meshes. So if you're looking at the 3D work over here, I know that the 3D work is accurately in this area over here, but becomes progressively less accurate over here. But we have run the 3D model using a larger particle, larger boulders, and then it starts to match more. So zoning decisions over here. If I go then back to the zoning decisions, we're sitting over here. So with this one, I conclude my part of the presentation and handing back over. And I will be available for Q&As afterwards, and you can speak to me afterwards as well. I will stay behind. I'm going to move into another really popular section now, uh, section 124s. Uh, which we as a council have the uh, job of administering uh, and that's something that's delegated to us by law and there are two fundamental reasons that you'll get a section 124. One is because there's a geotechnical issue which is for most people who have had a 124 here and the other will, because it will be because the building is structurally not safe. So two separate reasons. And uh, so in terms of the conversation I'm having here, it's really around the geotechnical stuff. Now, if you were uh, re-zoned from white to green, and this is the issue that a couple of people have got here, theoretically, your 124s were overtaken by the SARA zoning decision. So uh, you should have been, in an ideal world, contacted directly, personally, and given that clearance. Now, I know that hasn't happened, and I know in some cases it has been reversed, and that's why I've got Ethan here with me today to uh, give you some explanation and engage in that. But in all other cases, you went from white to green. If you had a 124, those 124s come off at that point. Places that were rezoned white through to red, the uh, section 124 notices remain in place for the time being and they are all being re-evaluated. The difference is that on a 124 it's seen that there is a threat of real and immediate danger such that the uh, engineers feel that you need to leave that place immediately and that's the impact of a section 124. Everything is being reassessed we have to be honest, it may be that there are some additional section 124s that have to be placed. Uh, if uh, you're in a white zone, you're still waiting for the process to uh, resolve the issues that you're facing. We've got 114 notices there. Uh, again, we're continuously checking them. Uh, in some cases, when you pick up a, an error, uh, that's embarrassing, but it's better to pick the error up and be honest and sort it than it is to turn your back on it. So we will continue to be examining the places in the, uh, in the white zones 
And uh, one of the issues for us there, of course, is that uh, if you remove a section 124 or a house is demolished for any reason, it may then cascade to the property below it because the houses above are giving a certain degree of protection. Now, there are some people who were in the green zone, the existing green zone. We need to differentiate that. The changes that we're talking about notices coming off are in the properties that were rezoned last Friday, not the already existing green zones. We've got a number of notices uh, in place in those areas. Now, there is an appeal process, and not everybody realises that, for a red sticker. So if you feel that you've been red stickered and uh, you're not satisfied that that is a sensible decision, you can go to the Department of Building and Housing. We will ensure that they get all of the information that we have got, that Sarah's got, and they will reevaluate that situation for you. So you've got another independent test. Uh, and if that fails, you still actually have the right to go to court. And you can argue it in court, and then a judge in the end will make that final decision. One of the outcomes of the uh, earthquakes, which far exceeded the predicted uh, likelihood for the scale ground acceleration, and this is, these are the highest ground accelerations recorded in any urban settlement ever. They may have happened in other places. They've never been recorded at 2.2 G. Uh, particularly over in um, Hethcote Valley. This means that the government will bring in some additional legislation as we finish this rezoning process so that areas that have been zoned red will be permanently removed from the city plan as areas for habitation. Because quite clearly this has rewritten the rule books around the scale of earthquakes that may happen in this area. So that is something that will happen. It will also impact on our civil defence plans as we take on board some of the lifeline issues that we've got. So we'll be reviewing land use and subdivision controls right across the Port Hills area. And uh, as I said before, we've got ongoing examinations and there are some areas of landslip where people are green uh, and that's nothing unusual. Uh, those landslip situations are all across New Zealand. They're a process of continuously monitoring them. If we've identified an area of land instability, uh, we go back to it as a matter of course. Um, costs is something I just want to touch on because it seems to have uh, aroused a few uh, headlines in recent times. Why are we, as ratepayers, contributing to properties on the hillsides in terms of properties in the red zones when we didn't contribute to properties on the flat? And the really simple answer is that the properties on the flat are covered by EQC. That was set up after the 31 earthquake in Napier because there was no cover for ground. And that was, uh, in, in this case, if you're on the flat, the problem is liquefaction directly under your house or lateral spread or one of those issues. So that covered by EQC and council doesn't put money into that. Similarly, cliff collapse, the problem is directly under your property. And again, as ratepayers, we don't contribute to that. Where we are contributing is where it's called natural hazards. I don't know earthquakes are natural hazards, but the definition here is that these are not an earthquake hazard. These are hazards that can be brought on by erosion of the hillsides. It's something that's happening further away. It's not on your land but it potentially, under certain conditions, will impact on your land. And under the Resource Management Act, councils have a responsibility to avoid, remedy or mitigate those sorts of issues. So we went to uh, Sarah some time ago and said, we have a responsibility here on the work that you've done. What do we need to be provisioning? And the number was $55 million. So we put $55 million in the annual plan for this year. We don't know what the final damage will be, uh, uh, but I think we're probably going to end up in round about the right cost zone. So I'm not actually ultimately anticipating a massive blowout around that. It could be at that figure, it might be slightly more. It's certainly at this stage not looking like 100 million, even if we went to a 50-50 split. Uh, finally, skirt safer, sorry, stronger Christchurch infrastructure rebuild team. 
Uh, they've got a huge job on, as you know, they're looking at the pipes and the lifelines and the roads. If you've got a house at the end of a road and that road passes through a red zone, your road will still be reinstated, the infrastructure will all be reinstated because the life risk in your house is assessed on the fact that you might be spending on average 16 days in that property. Whereas on a roadway or a pathway, it's just really like it was before around the cliffs here, it's assessed as being you're there for a relatively short time, therefore the life risk is much higher. So that work is being done. If you want to see where it's at on a day-to-day -day basis, go to the SCIRT, the SCIRT website, and you can get the uh, work that's happening in your area. There are hundreds and hundreds of projects underway as we speak. It's a great resource and it gives you what's been done, what's about to be done, where your area is if that initial engineering work has been done. So that's a quick overview of that. Um, we want to keep moving, so I'm going to go into the support and assistance package. Uh, we've then got a little bit of EQC, additional info after that. Then we'll get into those very important Q&As. So, welcome along. I just want to tell you briefly about some of the support services that are available to you. And what I'm about to tell you, everything is, um, the key points of everything that I'm about to tell you uh, will be contained in a brochure that's down on that back table. So the first thing that I want to talk to you about is that there are earthquake assistance centres. There is an earthquake assistance centre currently and it's based at the Avondale Golf Club. Now I know for a number of you that's way too far away and there, is, uh, there are discussions going on at the moment with members of uh, the Port Hill Strategy Group and some of the contacts we have within the Residents Association to identify what might be a suitable facility that's much closer to you to access and, um, and looking at putting into place an outreach centre from that earthquake assistance centre. And we will be doing that within the next week or so. But just for your information, there is an earthquake assistance centre and it's on the corner of Breezes Road and Wainoni Road and it's open from 10 o'clock until 6.30. And in that centre, there are a range of different agencies that may be useful for you to talk to. So there are earthquake support coordinators, there, are, there are, is EQC, there are at least three different insurance companies, um, there is the Christchurch City Council, there are, there are Sarah's staff there. And if you are planning to go, you might want to call through the Sarah 0800 number to, to book a time, particularly if you're wanting to get to speak to several of those agencies at the same time. But as I said, we're working on making such a facility available, at least in, in some short-term arrangement over the next wee while, so that you can access it a bit closer to home. The other, the other serv support services that are available are uh, include the temporary accommodation service and we have people from from that down at the back of the room. For some some people they may be required to move out of their properties or they may in fact be out of their properties and they may require some assistance in terms of financial support and they also may require some assistance in terms of finding accommodation. So the temporary accommodation service is available to assist you in, in that regard. There are also earthquake support coordinators. And in total, there are about 55 different people who are working in the role of earthquake support coordinators. And at some of the previous meetings, we've had questions raised about what sorts of support can these uh, coordinators do? What does that mean? And it, m most of you will have received a, a flyer as you came in, which was telling you some case studies of some of the stories of the sorts of supports that an earthquake support coordinator can help you with. So they can help you in terms of um, ensuring that everything that you've done in terms of the things that you are responsible for doing have, have, have done, and helping you to navigate your way through some of the different support agencies, the different services and the different uh, processes that you have to go through. So that's, that's available to you, and there are, again, there are people from the earthquake support coordination service down here today. Going forward, there's a Canterbury support line, that's an 0800 number, and this is a far br broader range of support services that are available to, to you, but particularly around social, what, what I would call social support. So if there is 
um, if you're wanting to talk about getting access to some counselling support or if in fact you know someone who might benefit from that then they can tell you where, how, how to access that and particularly in terms of free counselling services. There are also, they can tell you about a range of different social services that may well have been in, in place prior to the earthquake but have, but have moved and people may not be aware of where they have moved to or how to get hold of them and that, and that service is available. There is a kaitahu support line, and behind that kaitahu support line there are whānau workers who work in very closely with the earthquake support service. So that's an additional service that's available. Okay, so on that basis I'll hand over to Bruce from EQC. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Bruce Empson. I've met a number of you already, but um, hands up those of you who've got a problem with EQC. <laughs> I'm your man, that's why I'm here. Um, but I brought some reinforcements today. There's a couple of people here with me. Very happy to say we will wait behind and have conversations with you on an individual basis if we can try and help you through your processes. But I just want to, um, I'm conscious of time and I'm conscious there'll be lots of Q&As to go through, but I do want to touch on some key points as a result of these zoning changes. So the zoning changes are important to EQC as they are to you so that we can start to move forward with you. While you are white, or for those of you that remain white, it leaves us with a bit of a problem. Um, but of course that's all your 17 has been determined as the date where we can start to work with you as well. Um, red, or, red or green, let's just make a call. If you're red, you become priority number one for EQC. That's largely about the conversation that just wasn't had. Those of you that have been turned red will have around enabling you to make a decision based on the offers made. Um, and our part of that is if it's option one, then effectively um, you are passing your issues off to the Crown if it's option two, you need us to work with your insurer very quickly to allow you to make your decisions. So for that reason, for those of you in green, I apologise. Well, I don't actually, the those in red that need that effort and that, that takes priority for us. For those of you in the green, that have been turned green, um, the fact you've been turned green does not drop you to the bottom of a queue. The EQC model put in place post-September was based on a hub basis. So we're across the city, we're working in 21 different locations we work on a worst first basis. So our objective is to deal with the homes and the, and the issues for people who have the worst damage first. That's done across 21 different locations. Ferrymead Hub, you probably all know where it is, just down the road is focused on you here. And we'll continue to work through that. How is your property claim settled? So you, if you'll appreciate, you get three lots of cover every time you make a claim with EQC. You get a contents, a dwelling and a land cover. That's the way the Crown put this thing together in 1931, and for that we should be grateful. Um, I am. If you have over $100,000 of damage for any one of the events in any one of the claims you've made as a single event, you'll be moved through to your insurer for resolution with your home. So that's if you're capped. If your damage is over $15,000 but up to $100,000, then you're in the Fletcher PMO repair strategy. That's the program that EQC is running and that's for 100,000 homes, rough number. If you're less than $15,000 and it was just recently raised to $15,000, it was 10. If it's up to $15,000, we'll give you the cash subject to your damage not being structural. So if you haven't had chimneys come down and the like. So uh, people get irritated when we're using the word, but if it's cosmetic, so if it's paint and paper, then we'll give you the cash and let you do it yourself. Um, other than that, we are working it through, and there's been a whole lot of conversation about opt-out today, and I'm happy to answer questions if you want to, if you have them. Section 124, it's been touched on already. Now, the city will confirm with you, and I've, so I didn't want to irritate, um, there's a conversation about Section 124. We've already gone ahead and asked the city for a list of those of you that have had a Section 124 lifted as a result of the zoning change. Now we believe there are only 50 of those homes left that haven't been assessed yet. And within two weeks that assessment will be done. In fact, I know that assessments have started today on some of those properties so that we can get you into that position quickly that we know what's going on now that, that Section 124 has been lifted. If it hasn't been lifted, we can't go in. And I don't apologise for not putting people into, the same for, into an area of the same reason you can't go into it. It's about safety and the safety of the people that work for us. 
We've also put in place for you, um, so some of you that have been out of your homes for some time and moved out quickly post the events, um, you won't have even had the emergency repairs done. So if you are in white to green with a section 124 lifted, I ask that you ring 0800 damage and the message you need to give is, I'm, I've just been turned green out of the white zone on the Port Hills. I need emergency repairs into my home so that I can get into my home. And we've opened a specific channel for you. So if you ring, you will be pushed straight through to the emergency hub. So we've put a, one of the hubs is focused entirely on emergency repairs. And again, I am aware of customers who have had people into their homes today as a result of that. So there's a channel for you. I've gone green from white. I need emergency repairs so I can get into my home and we'll treat you with priority. So that's in place as of a couple of days ago. I make the point, if the 124 hasn't been lifted and you're in the green zone, we cannot start the repairs or get into the process. EQC provides land cover. We are the only country in the world with insurance on land. It's the only country in the, in the world with insurance on land. The criteria there is for residential and it has to have a dwelling on it. So empty sections don't have that insurance because you don't pay insurance, fire and, and general insurance on your property. That's what entitles you to that cover. But basically, it's not your entire section. It's the area of the section that you own that is within eight metres of your house and some other appurtenant structures, garages, clotheslines and the like. So there's, a, there's an entitlement based on the footprint of the property you occupy. There's also an entitlement based on access to and from your property. So if you've got a driveway, 60 metres as the crow flies is also covered under that cover and it covers retaining walls. I normally get a reaction in the Port Hills about that, but maybe you're a bit more subdued and we've run out of time. Um, I've got an expert or two with me here. Those of you with specific retaining walls issues, happy to try and answer for you later. However, the retaining walls are largely those walls that are required for your building structure. So retaining walls required for your home. If you put in retaining walls to put in the veggie garden, or the rose garden, they're not covered. It's those walls that are required for your house. Um, and retaining walls, if they affect, so if you and your neighbour have a retaining wall, we deal with you as a, as, a, as a team as opposed to individual retaining walls. So one wall gets covered for both um, neighbours. And that's the little map you should have, which tries to describe for you the land cover you get from government. Just quickly, um, and I'm trying to put some context here, not Skype to you, um, we've settled about 100,000 full claims. The small issue we've got is there's 485,000 of them. We've repaired about 17,500. In fact, since that's, we're doing 90 a day, handing the keys back to customers. Um, there's 100,000 to do. And we've paid out about $3.1 billion. Problem is there's about 12.6 is the total cost that EQC will pay out by the time we're finished. So we've made really good progress, but there's a long way to go. Ladies and gentlemen, the repair program, I talk about the 100,000 homes, we've put an aggressive target in place and hope to be completed by the end of 2015. That's the time frame. That's at 90 a day at the moment. And that's an extraordinary performance. There are about 8,500 claims in the Port Hills of which you are part. We have settled in full over 1,000. Leave 7,500 to go. Just to try and put some context around it for you. So what happens now, um, now that you've been zoned, and I apologise for those in the white zone, it doesn't apply, um, you'll either be cash settled, that's for over $100,000 or under $15,000, or you're in the Canterbury Repair Program, CHIRP we call it, and that's with Fletchers. Now, as was described by Nisa earlier, um, often you need to talk to us. We have established a customer contact team, two of that team are here today. We're based out of Beckenham and Avondale. We also run a service where we are in other locations around the city. If you ring 0800 damage, make a booking, we can have someone sit down with you with your specific needs and issues or concerns and try and walk you through them. We have a team of people dedicated for that.